Hello and welcome. My name is Avi Savar and I'm the president of Suzy. I am so thrilled to be here with you today and excited for the lineup we have in store. Today's topic is about connecting qual and quant. And this is something that we've been talking a lot about here at Suzy. Because if you remember, at the end of last year, we launched Suzy Live. Suzy Live is an in-depth interview platform that makes conducting video-based qualitative research easy for our customers. Suzy Live uses our own proprietary consumer network and takes care of the scheduling, the logistics, the transcription, the moderation, and everything in between, allowing you to instantly book and conduct live interviews with consumers in just a few clicks. The feedback on Suzy Live has been tremendous. And because of that, we've been spending time thinking about how Qual and Quant can work together to deliver powerful insights and help you make better business decisions. There are a ton of advantages to using Suzy Live. One of those is the ability to connect the dots between the Qual and the Quant in ways that no other software solution can. Because we have our own audience, the ability to conduct quantitative research in Suzy and then follow up with specific consumers based on their responses using Suzy Live and then refining and repeating this process has become a powerful workflow for some of our biggest customers. So today, that's what we're going to talk about, connecting qual and quant together to generate powerful insights and do so in a fraction of the time. In the next week, we're going to be launching the ability to save audiences in Suzy. You'll be able to filter audiences based on responses and push them into Suzy Live for seamless scheduling and following up. This is our first step towards better connecting the two systems and making the process of qual and quant research easier and more robust. We believe that this first connection between Suzy and Suzy Live sets the stage for a lot of the work we're going to be doing over the next few quarters. This includes adding better text analysis and even more use cases like focus groups and UX testing. Okay, so that's enough of the setup. Let's get into it. First up, our Chief Product Officer, Nick Goshat, and our Head of Market Research, Will Cimarosa, are gonna show you up close how this integration works and how it can be leveraged using a fictional brand. I love it when these two guys geek out, and I hope that you'll love it also. When Nick and Will are done, we're going to bring in leaders from our Market Research Center of Excellence to run you through a few specific use cases of how Qual and Quant together can be leveraged for foundational research, for concept testing, and for shopper insights. This is going to be followed with a Q&A hosted by our very own Chief Customer Officer, Katie Gross. It's a jam-packed agenda, so I won't take up any more of your time. Without further ado, take it away, Nick, and take it away, Will. Thanks, Avi. Nick and I are excited to show everyone um, some of the updates we've done to Suzy Live. Right? We've taken a platform that would now host both your quant and your qual, and we've turned it into a quant qual feedback loop. Um, in order for me to truly tell the story of, of why this is so powerful, it makes the most sense to start with a story about two very close friends of mine. Their names are Clem and Winnie. Um, in my past, I worked on both the vendor and on the client side, creating quant qual mixed methodologies. A lot of the times in China, Clem and Winnie were my interpreters and my translators. The complexity and the amount of detail that you need to go into to execute a centrally located quant qual mixed methodology approach in China required that we spend so much time together that we now are like family. When you spend hours upon hours in China traffic as pictured here, you become like family. And now when Clem and Winnie are in the United States, they stay with me. Here you can see Clem on Wall Street. We've had countless um, bad international badminton uh, matches, lots of different types of exotic hot pot, um, you know, and, and lots of late nights setting up quant quant mixed methodologies um, both as a client and as, as a vendor. Well, why was we spending so much time together? Well, let's look at just some of the, the complexities that made our lives difficult. Executing quant qual studies, especially from a central location standpoint, has been time consuming, expensive, and stressful. Let's start with a quant qual recruit, building a quantitative sample, right? That could be two weeks easily in and of itself. 
But when you're recruiting for a quant qual central location test, you've got a little bit of an extra added uh, quirk here. Not only do you need 200 to 300 category consumers who qualify for your study, they need to also be willing to travel to a central location to take that survey. And you don't know what you're going to learn during that. So they need to be flexible in case they're one of the respondents that you want to keep back for more qualitative feedback. This adds time, complication, and an expense to any study that can make it a barrier to, to, to leveraging a quant call feedback approach. Preparation. This is the other reason we spent so much time together, right? You can't do a quantitative uh, study with enough people in a traditional qualitative venue. Consequently, Clem, Winnie, and myself have traveled all over China, visiting dining halls, gyms, classrooms, empty storefronts, building stadium-like environments from which we could project a survey. The amount of time it would take to then set up the actual equipment, both the projection equipment, the proctoring equipment, and the data collection equipment could take up to two days just for one study. I mean, we've run countless wires through, you know, countless walls in China. Um, lots of troubleshooting. You can see a picture of me seeing if our one-way mirror that we set up um, randomly worked. It happened to be fully transparent and useless. We never knew what we were going to run into when we got there, but it was intensive in terms of getting all of the mechanics to actually work. Two days just to prepare a study was generous in many cases. So once everything's up and running, you actually got to execute the thing. You've got hundreds of respondents showing up to your location expecting to take a survey. Here you can see the hotel staff had been trained to direct respondents down to their stadium seats. Waiting for them was a handheld controller, like an old fashioned RF you know, remote control frequency where they could put in a key entry based on how they wanted to answer the survey question, which is being projected on a central screen. And you can see how that's working there. In the back room, we are keeping an eye on the results to decide what it is we want to learn more about and who it is that we would call back and select for that qual. You can also see the proctoring that was involved to keep this many people together at the same pace. These were time intensive, expensive, and exhausting. Again, that's why I've had to spend so much time with my friends Clement and Winnie. But no matter how much work it was, it was almost always worth it because qualitative diagnostics make your findings that much more actionable. Sure, there are lots of online platforms that you can go to to avoid the central location. There's a whole number of service providers that could do this for you. There are tech solutions that can give you both quantitative and qualitative feedback. And there's sampling companies that can get you the sample in a, in a, in a quicker fashion. But you still have to bring these all together when if you're going to write your report and your implications. They don't all live in the same place. You still have to jump from platform to platform. But you don't have to put up with that anymore. So Nick, what did we do about it? We built a new way to get um, qualitative feedback on your quantitative survey all in one place. We're going to use the Happy Animal T-shirt company that we introduced to you when we launched our Monadic feature earlier this year. Nick and I happen to be the founders of this company. And the um, Happy Animal Fish or Shark T-shirt is our bestseller. The board, as demanding as they are, want us to launch a new T-shirt. We've come up with a narwhal design, a penguin, and a hippo design. And using the Monadic tool that we launched last or earlier this year, we quickly, in a couple of clicks, were able to see how they performed. Our objective for this study was to outperform our fish shark tea in terms of appeal. We can see here that the narwhal, using our Monadic feature, had a 90% confidence level um, as outperforming the shark tea, but is basically a parody to everything else. This sucks, <laughs> though our board is demanding. We wanted stronger results, right? This is where the quant qual feedback loop becomes a real opportunity. What we have now done is we've added open ends to each of these key diagnostics. We asked the consumers what specifically they found appealing or unappealing in their own words. We asked them what makes it relevant or, or irrelevant in their own words, unique, believable, expensive, right? We allowed them to tell us in their own words why they rated it the way they did. Nick, can you show the, the everyone how it is that we take that feedback and, and turned it into a quant qual feedback loop? 
Yeah, so to show that, and just just to be clear, um, the board did they did they give us a few weeks to give that those answers back or no, they didn't. They gave us till Thursday no, next week. <laughs> okay. All right, so not a lot of time. So now we're in the platform. Um, you know, this is um, the analysis that you just saw um, in our slide export format. Obviously, very easy for me to just download that as necessary in a couple of clicks. Um, but really what we're excited to show everyone today and our t-shirt company was really excited to use um, was this feature here. So we're going to jump into these open-ended results. And here you go, Will. This is some of the feedback that we got. Um, and we've looked through some of this data already and we saw some interesting things related to how people were talking about design that we didn't really expect initially, is that, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there was positive and negative um, mentions around the design itself. Our goal is to make this more appealing and, and the design of a t-shirt obviously is critical, right? So what we wanna do now is learn a little bit more about what they mean. What do they mean when they refer to design? So let's select a couple of consumers who have talked about design in both positive and negative ways or have mentioned it. And let's use the quality of their responses to see if we're going to get someone that we think is articulate. What Nick right. is doing in real time right now is selecting the people for our call feedback. No, no urgent, you know, backroom panic, right? We're pulling the people right from the Monadic survey and we're turning them into a new audience. This is an audience that we can invite into a qualitative environment to find out what it was that made these designs either relevant or irrelevant to them. Great, so now we've got a mix of some negative and positive feedback. Um, so we can really dig in from a qualitative standpoint and actually interview these people directly in Suzy Live based on the responses that they gave here. That's correct. And remember the questionnaire was just six questions. It was overall appeal, relevance, expensiveness, believability, purchase intent with our open ends, right? So I don't feel like I need a monitor. I'm ready to go and do this. I'm gonna ask them specifically, what is it that you like and don't like about this? What would make this better? And let's jump to the highlight reel, shall we? We shall. What makes a t-shirt fit good? Like what is it about the fit that's important to you? Yeah, so it's gotta be soft. Um, that's something that I really value. And then it just shouldn't like just drape over me like a blanket or something. So I like it where it's not too snug, but snug enough and just kind of feels nice and cozy um, on my body. My favorite t-shirt is this one actually that I got recently. Um, it is a little bit fitted, but also a little loose and the material is very soft. Um, and it has like it's a graphic tee, so it has something on the front that's just kind of like irreverent and funny, and I like to wear it. And I remember I, the the image of the shirt looked like just almost like clip art from Microsoft Paint or something. It just didn't look like what the t-shirt would actually be. Um, it said fitted, and so that didn't look like a fitted shirt to me. So I kind of thought, well, that doesn't look fitted. I don't think I'd want to buy that because it doesn't really look fitted at all in the in the image. Yeah, I mean, it looked like one of the more like boxy type of cut t-shirts that I wouldn't really wear outside. And for the price, I'm not going to buy a t-shirt like that to only wear at home. You know what I mean? Yeah, the animal's not super important. I'm definitely more concerned about the fit. Um, like I said, as a school teacher, the kids kind of love seeing uh, their, te their teacher in a, in a t-shirt. And then with the animals, it's fun but I'm not going to wear, wear a t-shirt if it doesn't fit right. So I'd probably buy several of those t-shirts um, with the animals on them as long as it fit really well. But from the image, I didn't get the idea that it would. Yeah, I'd say the animal is probably like second most important to the fit and material. I'd say that is more important. So as you just saw in, in this example, both Jared and Mackenzie had thoughts on the design and the design wasn't just about the animal. It was about the actual cut of the shirt itself, right? The key feedback we got from both the likers and dislikers was that the shape of this shirt was too generic. 
It's not surprising because it's clip art. <laughs> it was generic. But what we're hearing is in order for them to find this appealing, it needed to show them more about what the shape of the shirt would be and suggest what the fit would actually feel like to wear. They also thought the price was somewhat um, unrealistic. They felt for, for a shirt like this, um, it was overpriced. So what did we do with that feedback? We took it and showed it to our designers. They were then able to get much more realistic renderings for both male and female cuts that also illustrate and highlight the contours of the shirt and the texture and feel of the shirt. We heard while the animal is important that the actual shape and the fit was just as important. So we made sure that that was clear. We were also able to bring down the price. Now you'll recall from our previous round, the Narwhal shirt was, was doing, it looked like it was, it was a, a winner. So we threw that back into the next test. As the founders of the company, we also gave the hippo another shot because I don't know, my daughter likes it. And as founders, we have that ability. And we also tested a line. What is going to be the best option for us? Right, so when we, we actually went and we relaunched the survey to a new t-shirt audience, let's take a look at the results. And again, this is the same monadic template that we've been using. And finally, we are actually seeing some results that we can take to the board. Our second round Narwhal t-shirt has now at a 95% confidence level outperformed all designs. That's what the A, C, D, E, F indicates by row. This is your classic monadic output by informing our designers to take these t-shirts, add the cut and the texture to it. We finally got numbers we can be excited about. We've outperformed our current t-shirt and we've outperformed all the other designs. Fortunately, the hippo didn't make it. To be sure, we also included the, the designs from round one. So a 4.71, Monadically tested against our first version is significantly outperforming it at 4.18. We did it. We actually improved our scores. We can feel good about going to the board on that meeting on Thursday. And and Will, how did we really key in on the feedback that we heard from a qual standpoint and then really go back from a quant standpoint and make sure that when we presented to the board, we were telling them when we actually listened to it? and we saw the lift and the change. Is that something we should show in the platform? Yeah, let's, what if we wanted to, let's show it in the platform. We can show how we could go back and optimize even more if we wanted to. So the feedback loop that Nick is pulling up is based on not just the numeric scores at the quantitative scale, right? But the actual comments that we got from respondents. And when we went back, we added a couple of other diagnostics just to, for a gut check. We added another diagnostic around the cut and seeming like it's for, for someone like me, right? With a 23% top box strongly agree that this seems like a, the right shirt for me, we feel much better that we're now on track, right? We can go and add additional diagnostics based on what we're hearing from respondents. If we wanted to learn a little bit more about how to make this feel like for someone like them, we can go back into the open ends, see what they said and invite them in in quarterly. What we've now done in one platform has, cre has created a feedback loop. You get your quantitative scores. You can go back to the individual responses and invite them based on what you're finding. You never know what you're gonna find, but based on the patterns that are emerging, invite them into qual so that you can quickly iterate and evolve. In this use case, we did that with our Narwhal t-shirt and we we're able to significantly improve the performance just through one iterative round. So what are the impacts of all of these changes? Right. Well, let's go back to the original Clem and Winnie story when we were setting up projects, traveling all over the place, trying to make these auditoriums, uh, stadium environments work, you know, between one and five days. Right. What we were able to now do with our monadic tool and our open end um, audience invite tool was take it from one to five days to set up to two clicks in five minutes. It's that same quick, easy monadic template that you're used to. But now with open ends, you can invite them into Suzy Live. Instead of spending up to two weeks in field, in this case, we were able to spend just four days. On Monday, we ran our first monadic test. We looked at the results and invited those respondents into Suzy Live interviews for Tuesday. On Wednesday, we showed the designers the results. They updated the designs and we were able to complete field work on Thursday. Right? We've taken a 10 to 14 day process. We're actually able to iterate it before the end of the week. The final analysis, I don't have to jump between platforms now. I've got my live interviews, my open ends, and my quantitative results all sitting right there. It's just a matter of, of clicking download. Right? 
We've been able to get a full project in under five working days, something that would, in the United States, for a central location version of this, cost you ninety dollars to $110,000, is just costing you about 17 Suzy live questions. We've taken the pain and the technical um, difficulty of getting quant qual feedback and turned it into one simple platform. So now what we're really able to do is go back to the board. We've run a couple of sprints, uh, quant qual analysis. And what we're able to say, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Will, is we've definitely seen a lift. And we, we tested, we ran... Uh, with quant, we we ran some qual, we went back and ran quant, we saw a significant lift based on the changes and updates to the designs that we made. We can either start production right away, get our t-shirts out there. We know people have been looking for other animals, you know, where the animal tea t-shirt contests, uh, they want the next line coming out. Or we have the decision to run additional research and actually iterate more. Can you just talk about the ability to just have this ongoing quant qual sprint capability and how it allows us to really make decisions based on research versus timeline or budget or other things that generally determine um, research outcomes? Yeah, so creating this quant qual feedback loop is relevant to a number of different use cases. Today, I just demonstrated or we just demonstrated the innovation pipeline. Right? We innovated a new Narwhal t-shirt. We used consumer feedback to, to improve it and measurably improve it. When you have a quant call feedback loop, though, it's useful for many other areas that are relevant to your business. It's very relevant to foundational learning, learning more about who your consumer is, their attitudes and behaviors. You can actually go and ask them about the things that you're measuring. The same is true with campaign or asset, de asset development or performance tracking or shopper marketing. You're able to then take the observations at a quantitative scale and double click down to the individual respondents to learn more. It actually enables you to be an agile researcher. You can get the feedback, iterate and evolve all in one easy to use platform. That's very exciting. <laughs> well, I've been uh, super happy to show some of these updates in the platform and now, well, I think you're gonna dig even deeper. Yeah, we're now gonna take you through the um, use cases for each of these pillars. So this feedback loop enables you to, to be more agile in, in terms of how you're going to design your research to inform acquisition, retention, and growth of your consumers. While we just demonstrated the innovation pipeline with a t-shirt example, this is relevant to foundational learning, campaign development, performance tracking, and shopper marketing. Let's double click into the foundational learning use case and see how this qualitative feedback loop can be used to make you more agile. Whenever you undertake a foundational learning study, it's about understanding who your consumer is. Who is the target? Who are they in terms of their attitudes, their beliefs, their demographics, ultimately so that you can get to a size of price. In this fast changing world, you need to know who the right consumer is and what is the right message to deliver to them. And foundational learnings are key to getting to that understanding. This quant qual feedback loop that we demonstrated can be a great way to get to that level of foundational understanding. You can begin by using your qual to go into the product journey, right? Find the category users in your, in your, that are relevant to your category and invite them into qualitative interviews throughout the product journey. Here, you can start to learn in their own words, all the different attitudes, all the different need states, satisfiers, dissatisfiers, and opportunity areas that are relevant at each step in the journey. These qualitative discussions should be targeted at learning what the breadth of experiences are. You wanna understand not just about the journey, but how they perceive the brand. What's important to them about this product category? What are the opportunity areas where they could be delighted more? This is an area of exploration with Qual. The broader the findings, the better. You wanna leverage your Suzy Live interactions to find the full universe of attitudes and need states so that you can then turn that into a quantitative survey. That will then be your measurement tool. You can now actually measure those occasions, those need states, those satisfiers and dissatisfiers. And with some of our advanced backend analytics, Suzy can even help you generate either personas or full-on consumer segmentations with, with supporting driver analysis. 
the output of a segmentation or foundational type study is usually going to be something that needs to be brought to life. It's not enough to know just who the consumers are and how they're, they're broken up. They need to be relevant to the people who need to act, who actually have to make the innovation. They need to be relevant to the people who make the brand assets. You need to bring these consumer segments to life. By having a quantitative and qualitative feedback tool in the same platform, just like we demonstrated with the t-shirt um, example, you can now go back and bring these consumers to life by inviting them into actual Suzy Life interviews. When you have findings around certain need states, why not go back and have the consumers talk specifically about what that need state entails? Find out in their own words, what are the satisfiers and dissatisfiers? Putting that in front of your brand team, putting that in front of your agency teams and your designers is going to be a great way to have an additional impact and bring your segmentation to life. You can now go and dive deeper than you ever did before by actually going back to the respondents and asking them why they answered the way they did. The first rule of research to always remember is you never ask someone something that you can observe. Here, everything is now observable to you in one platform. Your initial um, qualitative exploration informs the development of a, of a quantitative questionnaire. And now you can go back and learn more about those findings through this qualitative feedback loop and target consumers based on how they answered their survey. Bring them to life for maximum um, impact and for maximum agility. I'm now going to pass this on to Lima, who's going to share a little bit about how this can be done, this feedback loop can be used in campaign development. Take it away, Lima. Thank you for the introduction, Will. I appreciate it. Uh, for this session, we're gonna talk a little bit about creative development and testing. To build on what Will shared, I'd like to share a story with you. When I transitioned from the client side many, many years ago, a good bulk of what I did centered on copy testing, right? And for those of you who are aware, copy testing is really the very final stage of the creative development process. Um, and so what I have often heard when I was involved in copy testing is that there was always a lot of surprise with results, right? And copy testing is, is around executing a quantitative survey to assess how something is gonna do in market. And clients would often get surprises when we got copy testing results, either you know things that they weren't expecting to learn or hear or see in the data. And very often we heard things like, that's not what we heard in qualitative when we were early on in the development process. And so one of the things that we started to do is try to bridge that gap between early stage creative testing or even earlier than that idea generation to the copy testing end game so that when we got there, it wasn't a surprise that there was learning along the cycle so that when copy testing results came in, clients and agency partners were confident with what they were going to see and hear. One of the challenges, um, as Will had alluded to, was really around um, the time it took to do this kind of research and how labor intensive it was, right? And so in order to bridge that qualitative gap to that quantitative end game, what we would do is we did a mixed method methodology that was done in person for um, really done in central locations, right? Like focus group facilities where you would recruit in a whole host of respondents to um, take quantitative surveys. So you aim at having a quant sample come into a facility to take a quant survey using these dials, right? And then you're able as the client and as the agency, you're able to see the results in real time and pick people out from those quantitative surveys and then talk to them qualitatively. And the benefit to that kind of methodology was it really provides clients with quant confidence throughout the stages of campaign development overlaid with qualitative depth. And, and why that's important is you get your metrics, right? But you really want to understand the why behind the metrics because that gives you the power to develop your optimization plan, right? Um, so going back to our focus group facility where we have all these people coming in and taking these quant surveys and then going into focus groups, it requires a lot of time to recruit 
a quantitative sample, but it's also very expensive, right? And so think about these projects, you know, having a time window of about two to three weeks before you have your detailed learnings. And so some of what um, Susie can do here is actually truly remove those barriers, right? To make that process agile, meaning fast, um, and cost effective, right? So when you're recruiting into facility and doing these qual, qual mixed methodology projects, you know, you're looking at 50 to, you know, $125,000, depending on what your sample size is, right? Susie removes those barriers and lets you use this kind of agile integrated approach throughout the campaign development life cycle. So if you're at the beginning and you're exploring early ideas, you can have a quant survey launched to um, a sizable population, get some feedback on those ideas. And then based on how you see those answers coming in, you can cherry pick the people you want to pull into qualitative and talk to them to understand, you know, what was it specifically about the idea that you liked and you didn't like and why it was resonating with you. But even more critically is to understand if it's really landing on your campaign and brand objectives, right? Um, so all of these things are so critical in the process of unpacking why you're seeing the performance you're seeing quantitatively. Then you go to, you know, once you've got your ideas and you've, you know, worked on the expression of those ideas in some sort of rough or early stage um, asset, you can put those in front of consumers in that early stage before you go into final production and get feedback and really flag places that may need optimization, whether it's a little or a lot, before you invest heavily in final production. Um, and so that's really the benefit of this kind of integrated method is, is getting some quant confidence when you're launching things quantitatively, but also being able to have that insight and that um, depth that you can get qualitatively and explore the reasons why behind the measures that you're getting. Um, and all of this can be done in Susie's quant qual offering quickly, you know, five to 10 days for the qual and the quant to be executed and very cost efficiently, which really arms you with the ability to do it multiple times as opposed to doing one big project somewhere within that window of development, you can actually have the freedom and the flexibility to do it in multiple places throughout the campaign development cycle. Um, I've done many of these quant qual projects and the learning for clients is so important because it really does help bring the agency and client teams together comprehensively, cohesively. Everyone sort of goes on that learning journey together. So when you get to copy testing or even in-market measurement, there aren't surprises. So the benefit of these kinds of approaches is to sort of minimize the risk, the exposure, and the surprise once you've made that you know, investment in campaign development. That is all I have for you on this topic uh, this afternoon. We'll be happy to take questions later on. We have one more session, um, and I'd like to introduce you to Mary Baker, who's di our Director of Market Research at SUSE. Mary, take it away. Thank you, Lima. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about how SUSE Live's offering can be applied to the customer journey experience. Understanding your customer's journey has multiple benefits. It can drive sales to your brand and to your products and services. It can improve the effectiveness of the messaging and communication you provide along the way in, the, in that journey. What we help you to do is understand what those touch points are uh, and potentially pain points. We work with you to um, deep dive into your consumers via uh, Suzy Live's offering after some quantitative research we can really learn and get under the hood on what the potential uh, improvements might be. We work with you as you iterate and we can retest any uh, improvements to the process that you've made and 
again, have quantitative and qualitative work together to unearth uh, the reactions to these improvements and to really identify what impact they will have uh, on your business going forward. We recently implemented this type of study for a major technology vendor who sells their product both from a bundle perspective, also aftermarket. We were able to look at both of those consumer journeys. We were able to identify pain points as well as existing successes. And we recommended some improvements to the process and where they could interject in a more positive manner. Uh, they did so, and they were happy to see that when the consumer experienced their revisions or revised uh, offerings, they were much more satisfied with the process. Uh, they're working with their retailers to change the process as well, uh, who was also very open to receiving the feedback. We hope we can help all of our clients to identify those kind of optimization opportunities as part of their customer journey. Now that you've heard a variety of use cases for this methodology, I'd like to introduce our chief customer officer, Katie Gross, who will open the floor to some audience questions along with the team from our center of excellence that you have heard from in this presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Just waiting for our panel to rejoin us. Awesome. Thank you so much to all the presenters for walking us through all of that. As Mary mentioned, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. And I'm welcoming back our panelists for an open Q&A. Everybody was very active in the chat on the side. So I'm going to do a dive into all of the questions that you had, um, a deeper dive into some parts of the presentation and hopefully answer all the questions that you have. So I'm going to start off um, by saying thank you so much to everybody for the use cases. So if you can quickly go into a project timeline, what a typical project timeline would look like um, on the SUSE platform and how that might compare to traditional research methodologies. And Lima, I'm going to ask you if that's OK. Yeah, I think that um, the comparison is between how they're historically done and then how we can do it on SUSE. Right. And if you think about a normal, traditional approach, you know, you're you're recruiting your quant you're executing your quant, and then you have to spend time separately recruiting your qual, or if you're doing an in-person central location testing, you know, you're looking at a two to three week timeline easily, right? For me, the benefit of Suzy is as a client, you know, you know when whatever it is you're wanting to explore is going to be ready, whether it's a questionnaire, stimuli, assets, so you can recruit a quant audience, save that audience, and you're ready to hit launch as soon as a questionnaire is approved, right? So that's really the beauty of it. So you're saving a lot of time on the upfront, right? And so you can field your project sometimes in a couple of hours, depending on the, the population. If it's a, you know, general, you know, high incidence population, we can field it in a few hours. And then from there, pull those people right out of the quant survey and then have conversations with them the next day, right? Um, so the access to these people are almost immediately, right? I think the variables that may drive shorter or longer timelines are really the, the size of your audience that you're targeting, how niche it is, um, but very fast. And that for me, as someone who's been executing these for years, timelines have always been a big barrier uh, to implementation. And so Susie does truly remove that barrier. Yeah, wonderful. And actually, one question that was a follow up to that um, is what is the typical yield from invitations from a quant survey into the qualitative Suzy Live um, interview? And what we've um, historically seen is around about 80 to 90 percent, um, which I know is significantly improved upon from many of the other platforms out there. And it's in part because we own our own panel. It's also because, of course, we um, it's an integrated, seamless um, transition from the quant into the qual. So thank you for that question also. Hey, 
Can I build on one thing you said? I think this is a really important piece too, because I've, I've tinkered a lot with recruiting quant panelists into qualitative, right? And a lot of us who've been in the industry for a while know that there's a marked difference between the quality of quant panelists and the quality of people that are recruited qualitatively, right? What I've been really amazed about with Susie is the quality of these people when they're in a IDI or in-depth interview Susie live environment. These are good respondents, right? Because ultimately you want your qualitative to be set up around people who are articulate, who can share and think and, and you know really communicate well. And so we've had tremendous success not only on getting these people into Susie Live quickly, but the quality of them is also something that I think is really important to consider. Yeah. One thing that also helps with the quality is the way you could use the open ends. So in the example that we gave, we had we asked for specifics about what they liked and didn't like throughout there, right? When you see how articulate a respondent is in the open end, it's telling of how engaged and how um, how good of a respondent they'll be. It becomes almost also like a screening mechanism. When we have such high yields, it allows you to be selective with those that are going to, to be most likely be most articulate, right? Because we all know the risks of recruiting quality. You always have a couple of, of, of respondents that don't work out. Because we have such a high yield and you're able to use those open ends to explore what it is, the topic area that you want to go into, it can help ensure that you get that high quality respondent. Yeah, it's great. It's an incredibly engaged panel that we have for sure. Um, a question for Mary, um, how many interviews would you recommend per project? And what would that length of interview be that you would recommend? Uh, yes, uh, we recommend 10 to 12 per segment. So if you're at least uh, 10 to 12 per segment, if your sample is homogeneous, then we would you know, stay around there. Uh, but if you want to look at um, individual segments within that, then we would recommend that many per segment to really get a good broad understanding of opinions um, and perceptions among those groups. Um, from a length standpoint, um, we typically do 30 minute um, interviews, but it really depends on the objectives and how much, uh, how many topics you want to cover or how much STEM there is to look at. Um, so 30 to 60 minutes, probably ideal. Uh, but again, all of that is dependent upon uh, what you intend to test, what your objectives are um, and such. Great. Then the question that came in is about moderation. Who conducts the moderation for Susie Live? So I can take that one. It can either be yourself or it can be your own approved moderator. And we ourselves here at Suzy also have um, a list of approved moderators who have specializ specialization in certain areas. We also have a back room so that you and your colleagues can also take part in the kind of virtual two-way mirror and converse with the moderator while they are live moderating on Suzy Live as well. So a lot of fantastic functionality for, for collaboration. Another question that came in from the audience. What would you suggest is the right order to conduct hybrid quant and qual? Would it be qual first and then quant or a combination of the two? Will, I'll uh, hand that one to you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. It, it does depend on the use case, right? And, and what you need to explore, right? Exploratory, if you're looking to understand drivers and attitudes that you then need to go measure, it starts, it, it makes sense to, the, to open up uh, with qualitative find out what the range is of things that are important to consumers and that drive behavior and to then go and measure it. How, how important are those things that you've discovered in qual? Once you know and, and you've measured what drives usage, we then recommend that you start with quant. So in, in the example here, um, we didn't have any specific diagnostics, but we could have put them in from a foundational study. Diagnostics would have been additional questions like, seems like it has a good fit, seems like a premium brand, typical things that you'd get out of a, a foundational learning where you already have measured what those drivers are. You then test your ideas to see how they're performing, right? You look and see which ones are rising to the top and which ones are going to the bottom from a statistical standpoint. Because we have the open ends tied to those answers and you can see the performance differences, you can then dive into the comments. Dive in if one is underperforming or overperforming, dive in there and see what those responses were and save that audience and invite them into a conversation so you can learn the specifics of what's driving that. Once we, in this last example, understood that design really was about the look of the fit and it was more important than the animal itself, we were then able to iterate very quickly and go back and test it again. One thing that I want to point out is we kept some of a control, a benchmark that we knew was our best performing. And we also kept the top performers from the previous round to make sure that we'd actually made a difference. From there, we actually got 
success. We statistically outperformed both the control and the top performing uh, shirt from the first design, but we could have gone in and dug deeper. We could have found out from the, the likers and the dislikers what it was that they were, were driving their opinions and kept iterating and refining. So if you need to explore and then go measure, start with qual and get a measurement of what's driving behavior. Once you understand what that behavior is, use that to drive your basic questionnaire guide um, for your qualitative feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and actually, one of the questions that came in from the audience also was, um, what happens if, the, if the, kind of the narrative from both the qual and the quant come out slightly differently? Sometimes the qual story um, does not always match the quant. How do you marry the two? And I guess um, in part that is iteration. I, I'll, I can take that as well, right? So when how do you marry the two? Well, there's nothing subjective about this. This isn't a randomized selection of audiences. We're observing the actual answers, right? So if they're two different, you know, storylines, we're going to go in and identify what's driving those answers, right? So if someone, if if something is underperforming, we're going to go and actually select the respondents that indicated that this wasn't performing up to their standards and and learn why. We're actually guiding our qual around what the numbers tell us. It's, it's, we don't need to marry them if we can actually use the numbers to actually then go and find those specific respondents. You rated this low or poorly on a seven point scale. Tell me a little bit why, right? There's no need to line things up then. I've actually observed this respondent make that, you know, uh, answer, right? I can now go and find out what it was that was driving it to, to iterate. That's the beauty of the open ends, right? You can look at and see why they answered the question the way they did so that you can go and learn more. You're marrying it by actually asking the questions about the answers you observe them um, actually submitting on the quant panel. Fabulous. Um, a couple more tactical questions. How are discussion guides created? Does Susie provide strategic guidance um, along the way? We do have a full service component. So we do indeed have our wonderful center of excellence team who are available. Mary, I'll let you do a little bit more of a, an explanation around how we consult with clients on discussion guides. Absolutely. Um, typically moderators, if there's a hired moderator, they will typically take the reins on the discussion guide. Uh, but we also will provide content recommendations, flow uh, recommendations if you choose to develop a guide on your own. But an important component, as Will um, and Lima have talked about previously, is that we will, um, you're really looking to uncover the results from quantitative. So to you know, get under that hood. You'll you'll include some of, of the same topics um, to kind of um, you know explore with the respondents. So some of the content actually comes from the previous quantitative research, but it really depends on the objectives and what you're showing. And absolutely, we can provide guidance on that. Awesome, that is great. A couple of questions on the sample that can be used. So Susie owns its own panel um, of just over a million USA respondents, which we can segment into um, your own audiences that you may be looking for. And so therefore we will be marrying both the quant and the quantitative when it comes to the sample that is used um, on our platform. So I hope that answered your question um, there. And Lama, one other question I had for you, obviously you've worked client side, you've worked market research agency side, you've seen your very much fair share of platforms. Um, and so in your expert opinion, why do you think Suzy has a, a specific benefit when it comes to these quant qual um, kind of hybrid methodologies? Um, I think it's a great question, Katie, and, and I can't um, say enough times that the, the, the core benefit for me of putting my client hat on is access and speed, right? We are all moving at a thousand miles a minute, right? And, you know, we don't as as marketers, as clients, as brand managers don't have the luxury of time to build into our um, development cycles, you know, long research projects, those days are gone, right? And so part of what Suzy does is have um, the ability to access consumer feedback really quickly, right? So you can feel like you're on the journey for product improvements, developments, whatever it is you're working on, and can always layer in the voice of the customer, right? So that um, that voice of the customer is really feeding a lot of the things that you touch and do really quickly, very simply. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't stress enough the, the power of the combination of of metrics of hardcore quant numbers with 
the qualitative depth of what those numbers mean, right? And that means like, you know, you can you can show your leadership teams or whoever is, you know, well, whoever you're doing the project for, you know, a beautiful chart with, you know, a bar chart with numbers, but then you can hit a highlight reel where people are talking about what those numbers mean. And so that just brings a lot of things to life in a very compelling way to help move decision making, help move prioritization, help move actioning um, along a lot faster. So for me, it is really just the integration, the speed, the time and the economy, right? Um, Susie offers an incredibly cost efficient way of doing this. Yeah, I think that's a, a key point. Having personally been on both sides um, as a client and as a vendor, it, we shouldn't undersell the importance of the model, right? You're not having to screen each time that you run a survey. We build a panel around your screener, which gives you that quick access. You're not paying per um, per complete. You're paying by the question. And while that seems like a subtle nuance, it really does allow you to be more agile in terms of speed. In the example that we gave with the t-shirt company, we had a large sample of, of t-shirt enthusiasts ready to go. We were able to then field that over, you know, in one day, in a couple of hours and iterate very quickly again, either towards the same audience or to a fresh one. In this case, we chose to do a fresh one to see if we had outperformed the original, right? But when you're not having to recruit and incentivize each time that you want to do a quantitative study, it really allows you to have quicker turnarounds. We were able to, to run that study where we had one day of quant, one day of, of qua, refinement, and then go back into field. It's very easy to do because we're not screening the respondents each individual time. We're building that panel and we're targeting as we as we need to and as we see fit. Yeah, absolutely. And with our amazing um, show up rates and, and yield rates, also it's a it's a significantly faster way of conducting um, the research. Thank you so much to everybody. That looks like all the questions that we have right now. So as a quick reminder, Suzy Live is available today. Suzy Live Save Audiences will be available in all of our current clients' dashboards on the 29th of June when it goes live into the platform itself. We were really excited to have you all here um, and we're super excited to have you all test out the new Suzy Live features and continue to build out a rich consumer insights platform. If you have any questions, please reach out to us directly or reach out to your customer success manager for any more details or any um, kind of thought starters that you would want to discuss with anybody on the panel here today. Happy to set up a call um, with either them or people on our sales or customer success team. Thank you again. Wishing you all a very happy start to the summer, even though it's very much raining here in northern New Jersey today. Thanks, Thanks everybody. And thank, thank you to you. our panel. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.